Welcome out there, Internet land. My name is Philip Balky, Central Texas Mycological Society President. Um, we're here for another Myco Hangout meeting here on this rainy Thursday. I'm joined this evening with Doug Beerend, uh, here to talk about his new book. Um, oh, shoot, I'm just totally blank on the title. I don't have it written down in front of me. Talk about me to mistake. Well, anyway, Doug, would you uh, introduce your book and yourself a little bit? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no uh, problem. It's called In, in Search of Mycotopia uh, with Chelsea Green. And uh, I'm done. Hi. I wrote it. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about my experiences, share some photos with you from the reporting trip. It took me to 13 states and three different countries outside the U.S. So I find it interesting. Awesome, yeah. I got the chance to read a little bit of it, and uh, it was really nice to get to see uh, all my friends and acquaintances throughout the micro community kind of mentioned and talked about. It was, it was really, really interesting, really interesting stuff. Um, so, you got a presentation for us to start with, or do you want to? How do you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, I could kick it off with. Um... Just with the slideshow, I guess. I was thinking I might read an excerpt, but uh, I figure I'll just cut to the chase. Um, so let's hope this works. This is uh, one of those technological uh, you know, dice rolls. So we'll see if this uh, slideshow situation pans out. So please just bear with me. All right, that should do it. Can you confirm? that you see the picture that's showing up? Yes, I can see it. Oh, excellent. All right, so here we go. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you all. I actually, as you'll see in the photos, I uh, made a visit to Texas to the uh, Circle Acres Myco Research Station where I uh, saw Philip for the second time. I actually met him for the first time at uh, Microfest in uh, Pennsylvania. But uh, this is about my book, In Search of Mycotopia, which um, I guess I'll preface a little bit just by kind of talking about that title. Um, and it, it's sort of inspired by the, the term we'll hear a lot or the phrase the, about mushrooms saving the world and you know all the promise that um, people see in fungi and mushrooms and in building productive reciprocal partnerships with, with the kingdom or queendom uh, fungi. And the book was a, a, a ostensibly sort of my attempt to, to find, you know, the, the, the hope that I was hearing about in, in mushrooms. And, um, you know, spoiler alerts, I, I do, I think, find that hope, but it's maybe not in the expected places. And so this slideshow will kind of take you through some of the themes that I cover, um, places I visit, and um, the way that you know, the, that all wraps up with kind of my my conclusions about, you know, what that sort of phrase means. So this is the sort of thing that um, most people probably think about when they hear the term like mushroom or mushroom culture. Um, it's the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Colorado, where I'm sure several of you have been. Um, and it is a major mushroom festival. It definitely is uh, definitive of mushroom culture in this country, at least to a certain extent, um, is an emphasis on fungi as medicine uh, and theogens, you know, the psychedelic dimension. Um, and it's, I think, representative of a certain uh, kind of maybe older culture. Um, and it contrasts in my experience with some of the newer, uh, younger 
more diverse scenes that are emerging around the country. Um, you know, this is a little bit more on the kind of hippie side of the, the spectrum. Um, and there, of course, is the Amanita muscaria in truck form. Uh, when I went out there, I was very interested in finding it, and I did um, very quickly, which I took as a certain signal uh, from the fungi that I was uh, on the right path. Um, and some of the other kind of stuff you might encounter in these scenes is the uh, the suggestion that fungi are uh, you know visitors from space that they came from another planet. Um, it's called panspermia. This uh, theory, people might argue with my characterization of it as a theory, but Personally, I find it actually much more profound to consider them our relatives, um, our earthly relatives. Um, and you know, from what I understand of genetics, that is uh, that's what's been shown to be the case. Um, my introduction to mushrooms and the kind of mushroom world uh, and communities looked more like this. This is in Rochester, New York, at Smugtown Mushrooms. Um, they're a relatively small scale cultivator led by Olga Sogas on the right, um, who founded it. Uh, I visited them in 2015 for an article I was writing, and that actually is what kind of kicked off the, the process of writing the book. Um, it was for me, uh, I had seen Paul Stamets, a uh, quite well-known uh, TED talk called um, Six Ways Mushrooms Can Save the World, um, which gets into many of the themes of like microremediation, um, food and medicine, um, kind of galaxy brain, literally, uh, ideas of like networks being reflected in mycelium and in cities in the internet in our brains in the structure of the universe itself. Um, but when I walked into this room, my connection to mushrooms looked more like this, just golden oysters growing out of spawn blocks and smells I had never experienced before. Um, and also just sharing space with these organisms, which uh, was relatively new to me. And uh, here, just a little tour of it. It was it was also really alluring to me because it was so kind of bespoke and ad hoc and and kind of punk in the way that it was put together and operated. It was all volunteer. Um, you know, things were. I mean, the, the autoclave there, which is the, for anyone who doesn't know, just a massive sterilization chamber, a pressure chamber that allows the, for killing off the uh, competing microbes in the substrate that you introduce the fungus uh, to cultivate it. Um, on the right there is a, a sort of, you know, pieced together flow hood and, and Olga's um, culture library. She works with uh, largely uh, local strains that she finds in the area of Rander and Rochester. Um, and already in that you can kind of see some of the the values that i started to observe in these spaces which favor uh, locality indigeneity um you know labor for the sake of the work not necessarily for the sake of profit um i got the sense that this was a company that was sort of in business because it had to be not necessarily because it wanted to be um they were doing about 200 pounds a week which is fairly modest compared to um, larger operations um, but like I say, a definite punk vibe, but definite like each one teach one mentality. Um, as she put it to me, you know, her goal would be to see this extend into a, a sort of um, egalitarian, uh, almost socialist kind of, um, you know, value exchange uh, and a community that was sort of at the center of it for her. And she wasn't trying to become the biggest mushroom cultivator in the world. Um, some of the other values that I, I derived from my visit were closing loops. There's a lot of permacultural concepts that enter into conversations around fungi, the ideas of turning outputs into inputs, the idea that waste is a fairly uh, unique concept to the human species. And maybe fungi can be helpful in uh, changing that and turning our agricultural waste products at least into uh, you know, food for the next uh, step in the trophic chain. Um, all of that was profound enough, but it was really walking into the woods with Olga the next day um, that kind of expanded my my perspective and, and set me on this course. Um, we went into the woods and, and with her guidance and her expert um, knowledge of fungi, I was able to start seeing them for the first time. I, I got my eyes, as it's sometimes said. And so I was seeing mushrooms that I had never seen before. The artist conch, um, which for anyone who doesn't know, Ganoderma applanatum, you can do this with it. Um, 
full disclosure, I am not an artist and I probably wasted that opportunity, but um, it's pretty cool that you can do that with a mushroom. Um, we found lion's mane growing out of a woodpecker hole and we took home and ate. And so I was instantly connected to or introduced to this concept of abundance that fungi seem to represent. Um, and it also started to strike me that this was a kingdom, uh, again, maybe I should use the word queendom or kingdom or queerdom, which is preferred by some people in these communities. Um, but it's no less, whatever you call it, it's no less prolific or profound or fundamental than plants or animals. And to imagine walking into a forest and not seeing those you know, other kingdoms, um, you would really be missing what's happening and, and the nature of your environment. And that's what's that's what was happening with fungi and me up until that point. So um, I'm fairly convinced that simply noticing mushrooms uh, really starts a, for it can, it did for me, and, and I know a lot of other people this is true of, it starts a process of, of learning and exploring and of noticing and it really opens up one's um, sense of the natural world um, and deepens our appreciation for it. Um, it also is uh, always a good time to smell a mushroom. Um, it's one of the ways that people get to know them best, I think. Um, now, all that's nice uh, to talk about, but of course, this was a business. And so they were um, preparing when I was there to go to Pennsylvania, which is uh, in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania specifically, which is called the mushroom capital of the world. Um, and it certainly is the mushroom capital of the United States. Um, it's where most of the mushrooms are grown, largely button mushrooms, um, criminy, white button, um, portobello, which are all agaricus by sporus, as many of you probably know. Um, but the real mushroom capital of the world would probably have to be China um, by a long mile. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of stuff that we might uh, see at a farmer's market or a mushroom uh, festival, the oysters and uh, other types of specialty mushrooms, so-called, which uh, aren't exactly the most shelf stable mushrooms. And so they kind of favor a local market and a local economy. And, and again, there are certain sort of values that start to emerge from those things. Um, and there's also a lot of citizen science being done around cultivating new and, and recalcitrant varieties. Um, Garden State mushrooms, for example, uh, just worked out how to cultivate uh, beefsteak mushrooms, um, Fistulina hepatica. Um, which is interesting. It's a mushroom that looks and tastes like steak when you cut it. Um, and kind of to the point of noticing this stuff, um, it was taking these unfamiliar life forms home with me and sharing space with them that really um, kind of cemented my, my interest and my, my, my curiosity. Um, and it's why I recommend anyone who's, you know, starting to, to become interested in this subject to get a grow kit, you know, grow them at home. It really is as simple as adding water usually. Um, and it, it just, it's sort of like a house plant, but one that you can eat or put in your tea. And also one that expands your perspective on the natural world. And for me, it led to cultivating them myself. These are the first mushrooms I ever grew myself. I went to a horse uh, training facility in Queens and got some hail, uh, bales of hay, took them home, sterilized them, inoculated them. And these emerged on the very day that I signed the deal for the book. So I took it as a sign again that uh, I was on the right track. And then I ate them. Um, and that set me off. And one of the things I was really interested to see was cultivation um, and how it looks in different contexts, different places. It's something that can be done at a variety of scales and all sorts of environments, um, assuming you can control for certain things like temperature and humidity. Um, this is front range fungi, unfortunately no longer with us after COVID, but um, they were just at, on the outskirts of Denver when I visited them. Um, that's Trevor Garofano, who was working there at the time. And they're an example to me of how flexible this can be, sorry, wrong way, and portable, um, literally in this case, because it was um, operated out of a pair of trailer trucks that had been converted. The left one is the uh, incubation section where the lab and the uh, the, the, where the lab was where they kept the strains and where they would inoculate the, mush, uh, the substrate. And then on the right was the uh, fruiting chamber. And you can see they've uh, cut uh, holes in the side of the trucks and put a chute between them. So it's kind of like pirate ships uh, next to each other and they just pass the bags back and forth. And they had started uh, colonizing the uh, abandoned warehouse that they were parked next to. Um, 
and building their uh, their lab out in there and stuff. So um, one thing you'll often see around a cultivation operation is a lot of spent blocks. Um, and I should put spent in quotes because after you get two or th maybe three flushes of mushrooms, they're often tossed out because they're not necessarily economically viable at that point, but they are still biologically viable. And they're used, um, and people put them in the ground just to build soil, maybe get some bonus mushrooms. One of my friends out there, um, Mercedes runs a company called um, Eco Springs in Colorado Springs, which as a service will install uh, mushroom, these very mushroom blocks from this very company, at least back then. I don't know how that looks now, but um, into people's gardens as a kind of value add. Um, they get richer soil, they get mushrooms that they can eat. Um, and in fact, uh, these mushrooms here were from her own garden where she had done this and she took them to the farmer's market and sold every single one of these. So there's some economic uh, value in it too, if you're growing food. Um, moving up on the kind of scale of mushroom cultivation, this is at uh, Mycoterra in Western Massachusetts. Um, the largest, as far as I'm aware, uh, mushroom farm in the state, but still very small compared to Pennsylvania. Um, because as uh, the founder, Julia Coffey put it to me, um, the uh, the mushrooms they sell only account for 2% of the market in that state, um, despite being the largest grower. So it really speaks to how, how big the, um, the state of Pennsylvania is in this uh, scene and also how much opportunity there is for local producers to, to meet that demand. Um, that's the autoclave. That was the clean side. This is the dirty side. You start to get a sense of the scale of this stuff. This is another, uh, this is a converted horse uh, training arena, you know, uh, operating at a, a higher scale than, than what I had seen before. Um, I think they're about 2,500 pounds a week. So more than 10 times what I saw at Smugtown. Um, these are black pearl oyster mushrooms that they were, uh, or black pearl mushrooms, which are a hybrid of oyster and something else. Um, it's getting more popular. And then slamming to uh, the other side of the scale and also the other side of the continent, this is in Vancouver, um, British Columbia with Willoughby Aravalo, who wrote an excellent book. If anyone is interested in just cultivating mushrooms at home, it's called DIY Mushroom Cultivation. And it's, um, it's just a great book. I highly recommend it. And it really proves that you can do this anywhere. Um, this is liquid culture. It's basically mycelial fragments in a nutrient broth um, of lion's mane. And you can see it has... He's left it in the you know closet for long enough that the mycelium has reformed and has started reaching for the top of the jar. Um, I don't know if he left it long enough, it would start to unscrew the lid, but um, he caught it before that happened. So um, this is the low tech, no tech kind of approach. You know, we're talking about mason jars with sterilized marbles for agitators, and um, you know, this is part of the you know, some might call like a revolution in cultivation where it's just becoming accessible to people, um, no matter their means, it's just a matter of their interest really. And uh, the, you know, possibilities of that for food, for environmental remediation, medicine, um, local economies, you know, it has yet to be seen what'll happen, but I think it's quite promising. And this is just more of Willoughby's kind of setup here. He's, you know, incubating uh, his cultures next to a water heater growing mushrooms in the shower, shower as fruiting chamber, um, which has some euphemistic potential. But then there's um, also, of course, the science of mycology. Um, this is all, you know, practical, basically farming or food production, but the science itself is uh, a bit older, um, even though it's relatively young compared to the other natural sciences. It was only in 1969 that fungi were uh, discreetly given their own kingdom. Um, before that, they were kind of considered a, a subset of plants. So here you can see where it kind of all started. This is at Kew, um, the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in London. This is the largest fungarium, they call it, on earth with about 2 million species of fungi and slime molds. Um, each of these boxes contains a specimen. And this is what the science of taxonomy, the differentiation of species comes down to. It, it always has to come down in, in the end to a physical specimen that people can observe and compare to others. Um, something that's changing uh, with the advent of DNA sequencing, which we'll get into a bit. 
Um, it's also a cool place to visit if you're interested in fungi because, uh, you know, you get to see cool things like this. This is a uh, Citarius darwini or Darwin's fungus, fungus which is uh, one that he found in Tierra del Fuego. You can see his uh, signature on the little slip there. Um, so when they're not centuries old, they, uh, they're bright orange and they grow off the sides of trees. Um, this is a ram skull with an ascomycete, a bone eating ascomycete, apparently, that has grown around the horn. It's pretty cool kind of heavy metal. Um, and there are more common, uh, you know, examples, obviously, like in the left-hand side there, you can see a marmite jar and that's made with yeast, Saccharomyces uh, fungi, which are very common to brewers. This is a very old cordyceps, um, also a very cool looking one, if you ask me. We'll get more into cordyceps later. They even have a drawer full of slime molds, which, um, you know, I would probably have to if my roommate would allow it, but uh, they're not actually fungi, but they used to be um, lumped in with them, kind of confused with them. In fact, they were called myxomycetes and mycetozoa, which is literally like fungus animal, which I love. Um, they, uh, they have traits that make them a little bit animal-like, if you see them, especially with the slow uh, uh, time-lapse photography. And they also have what are called type specimens, um, thousands of them. And these are the sort of foundation of the identification of a specific species. So um, the folders with the red uh, band on them are sort of ground zero for the identification of, of whatever species is in them. Um, fungi are also studied uh, for their immediate, you know, practical uses. Um, I hesitate to say uses in this context because we prefer terms like working with or partnering with, but um, when you're talking about agriculture, like um, Danielle Stevenson here at the UC Riverside in California is dealing with, um, she's dealing with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, the uh, types that entangle themselves with the roots of trees and actually enter the cells themselves and form these little tree-shaped uh, interfaces. Um, it's a pretty profound thing to see like a tree within a tree through the microscope. And you can see just how fine they are um, the blue thread on the right there is a hyph uh, fungal hyphae, um, and that giant brown column is a root hair. So it shows you just how incredibly um, thin they are. And, and um, nevertheless, you know, despite being thin, uh, they are profoundly important to soil ecosystems and to trees. Um, her studies are related to uh, crops and their potential benefit for uh, mitigating contamination, bacteria, other fungi, um, and, uh, you know, there's interesting examples of how they might, like, for example, cover themselves in copper that would otherwise potentially contaminate the, the tree. The fungi will use it as a form of protection from other microbes, um, and so they're looking at how those sorts of uh, properties and capacities might end up helping agriculture. Um, and of course, that's distinct from how fungi are often uh, studied, which is as pathogens, as threats to plants and to agriculture, and which is valid because they have a history of doing uh, damage to plants, to agricultural fields, to houses. Um, this is an example in Utah that I saw of a bark beetle um, ravaged tree, which was one of just hundreds in, in the immediate vicinity that you could see with the naked eye. and. Um, the person I was with mentioned to me that, you know, it's actually not the beetle that kills the tree, it's the fungus that they carry with them. And it's true that um, bark beetles carry fungus with them, various types of fungi in really amazingly um, specific relationships in some cases where like the two have evolved to kind of work with each other. It's symbiotic, um, but they're often perceived as being symbiotic to one another, but uniformly deadly to the trees. Um, I talked to Dr. Diana Six, who studies um, bark beetles and fungal ecology, who told me that it's probably not the case that the fungus is what's killing the tree. Um, and in fact, that uh, this whole process of, um, and, and you know, I'm, this is maybe rose colored glasses, but she left me hopeful that maybe this process is, is leading to a more resilient forest down, down the line because the conditions that are leading to more beetles, climate change caused conditions, drier, warmer, um, are leading to the deaths of these trees, but that may end up leading down the line to more resilient forests because the trees that are left are gonna be the ones that, that survived those conditions. So here's hoping 
Um, I was there though, not to look at trees or think about beetles, but uh, to find mushrooms with Bryn Dentinger on the right there. It's his class that I was uh, there to accompany. Um, he used to work at Q, actually. He was the, um, I don't know if he was the curator there. He was the head of mycology there, I think. And now he's teaching at the University of Utah and also operating the fungarium and the fungal studies at the Natural History Museum of Utah. So um, he's going out to the mountains with his students to collect mushrooms um, just to find out what mushrooms are there, basically. He's sort of combining his roles and uh, teaching his students about fungi in a way that it helps him to build uh, an understanding of the fungal biodiversity, which, as many of you probably know, is woefully understudied. Um, they estimate that we only know about 10% or less of the total fungal species out there. We don't know what's out there. We don't know what we're losing to climate change um, or habitat loss or development. Um, and so he is teaching these students, his students how to identify mushrooms and you know, using morphological or physical traits um, to identify what they find. But then based on their rarity, whether they have it in the collection or not, he enters them into the Natural History Museum's fungarium, which if you remember how Q's you know, vast hallways looked, um, seems kind of reminiscent of the one on the left there, but actually the entire fungarium is just that closet in the middle and right-hand pictures. So it's much, much smaller. It was not a, even in existence before uh, Bryn got there. He launched this fungarium. And so um, they're working with amateurs, um, students, enthusiasts to build out their picture of the fungal biodiversity in their, their region, which is a theme we'll come back to um, shortly. But the uh, the DNA that I mentioned earlier um, comes up here because part of his project is studying how fungi relate um, across landscapes. And to do that, they study the DNA. They, they compare using um, high-powered computers and, and international online databases um, the relationships of the different uh, mushrooms that they find. And his study is of Belitz specifically from South America and West Africa, I think, and it's related to the 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 original um, the original state of those two continents as one continent. Um, so the theory is that you'll find some in one that are related to those in another, and it's because the two land masses were connected, which is pretty interesting. Um, the comparison of those sorts of things leads to what's called a phylogeny, which looks like this when you unfurl it. Um, and it's kind of hard to see, but the colors are coded to the place where they were found, the, the continent on which they were found. And I noticed that some had like blue next to red, and he was saying, yeah, it's probably because they traveled over and, and got established at some point when the two land masses were connected, potentially. It's a theory. Um, but it's the sort of thing that's being, um, you know, it, it, it involves high-tech equipment and um, sophisticated techniques, but it's something that anyone can do, really, if you've got the curiosity and, and time. Um, this is a device that um, it's called, an it's from Oxford Nanopore, and it's a pocket-sized genetic sequencer, basically. You just plug straight into your computer, and so um, you know, it's leading to people doing this kind of testing in the field. Um, they don't have to go back to the university or even talk to the university. They can just produce the sequence and then send it in for analysis to wherever they want. Um, I also just included this because I thought it was funny. That was on his wall. Um, and then that will take us to Texas, actually. So uh, here is the Circle Acres um, site just outside of Austin. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's, um, it's a remediation site. So, you know, speaking of fungi and landscapes, uh, it's another thing that a lot of people are really excited about is their potential to uh, clean up contamination, to um, build soil health, um, kickstart biodiversity in places that are suffering a lack of it. And this was what was being demonstrated um, by one Daniel Reyes, um, who was teaching a course on the kind of basics of fungi, just to local 
enthusiasts and curious people. And it's a kind of class that you'll see throughout the country, which I find really interesting. Um, I think it's probably inspired by a lot of the same books, TED Talks, um, but there's a certain sort of fungal pedagogy, uh, informal fungal pedagogy that's been emerging um, throughout the country where you, you'll find people learning about the biology and ecology of fungi. Um, there are many applications, the applied mycology um, dimension, which is what gets a lot of people excited. You know, the possibilities of new materials or medicines or um, environmental remediation techniques in this vast unexplored, you know, dimension of the natural world. Um, and so you'll find a lot of the same kinds of workshops and conversations and lessons happening here. People are being taught how to inoculate, um, I guess that's grain spawn, um, uh, to take home, grow mushrooms, um, and again, just share space with them and kind of get familiar with how they live and operate. Um, and also getting some hands-on experience with uh, using them in uh, a gardening context. Um, so there you have some, uh, some oysters growing out of straw. Um, so the remediation potential is really based in their ability to uh, produce exudates that um, break down their food uh, or fend off predators or, or competitors, but um, those same compounds can also be leveraged to break down hydrocarbons or um, you know, prevent certain pathogens from entering the ecosystem. And so that's what people are excited about. And here's another example of one of those classes, um, this one in Brooklyn. That's Craig Trester. And this is his uh, uh, class at the Biotech Without Borders Community Lab in Brooklyn. Um, again, just people curious about fungi showing up to get a hands-on exposure to them. Um, those, those are wet cardboard strips that are being inoculated with oyster mushrooms, and they turned them into little fungal burritos that everyone took home. And you know, you could just watch them grow fuzzy and then throw them away. If you did that, fine. It's just a little bit less cardboard in the waste stream. You could turn it into a compost pile uh, for cardboard. You could just keep tossing all your cardboard in there, you know, hopefully not with any ink, uh, you know, toxic inks or whatever in it. And, uh, you know, make that a part of your kind of home uh, ritual. You could start a cultivation business, you know, if you really wanted to from, from or maybe not a business, then just an operation. You could be growing oyster mushrooms at home, starting with that little burrito that you took home. So I found that quite um, intriguing. And just an example of some of the bio uh, fabrication um, micro materials. This is in London, actually, again, at the um, Art and Design of Fungi uh, art show at uh, Somerset House, which to me kind of showed how widespread the appeal of this is becoming right? at a, a nice Tony uh, art gallery in the middle of London, you're seeing, you know, mushroom shoes and mushroom bricks and other kinds of uh, fungal um, curios. Um, the shoes on the left are a bit more on the, I think, conceptual side. They probably aren't super practical, but if you want examples of um, really amazing and refined kind of myco materials, uh, you could check out a company called MycoWorks or Ecovative. Um, they are doing some pretty high tech stuff in this space. Um, let's stick into the remediation point. This is in Connor for Colorado uh, with the Coalition for the Upper South Platte. That's Jeff Ravage. Um, and in that region, they, uh, they have been dealing with wildfires um, for over a decade now that have just become really um, devastating, worse each year. Um, they tend to be crown fires, which um, just spread very fast and get to such intense levels of heat that they essentially sterilize the landscape and bake the ground. And so what they're doing there is trying to log um, the trees into a pattern more mosaic-like and resembling what it used to be. Um, According to you know, there was indigenous uh, stewardship that that contributed a lot to this um, involving fire, but also just naturally certain trees grow in certain places and and in certain environments and microclimates and that's not necessarily how loggers are going to be thinking about you know their tracts. So they're trying to kind of reflect that more in the way that they log, and then the chips, the wood chips that are generated from that logging, they are inoculating with local 
strains of wood rotting fungi, oysters, other types, within 30 to 100 miles at most of the site that they're operating in. Um, they inoculate the wood chips, and the idea is that that will accelerate the turning of, the, of those wood chips into soil, uh, into compost, and then they can kind of kickstart the ecology in these places that have been destroyed by fires. And this was a test plot, which when they started, I think five years earlier, it was something like five feet taller. Um, it's a huge pile of wood chips. And, you know, digging below the um, first layer there, you find uh, compost, basically. Um, it really seemed to be working. And uh, it was even producing mushrooms. And that was uh, very exciting for Jeff because uh, he assumed that the bears had come and taken all the mushrooms, but he took those home with him. So uh, you, also, you gotta get a sniff. <laughs> um, and this is his home lab. Um, again, a lot of these kind of DIY um, lab techniques, cultivation techniques, they're being used in, you know, growing for growing mushrooms uh, to eat or put into tinctures or whatever, but they're also being used uh, to remediate landscapes. And so this part of that fungal pedagogy, people are learning to, to cultivate um, for whatever purposes they can imagine. Um, and this is where we'll kind of segue into some of the more um, social themes, I suppose. Uh, this is also taken at the Circle Acres, incidentally. It's a schizophilum commune. Um, it's one with um, over 23,000 mating types. Uh, they're often cited as an example of why and how fungi kind of challenge our conceptions of binaries. Um, they can challenge our conceptions of value as well. And um, they are increasingly kind of at the center of, of conversations about equity, um, you know, queerness, um, anti-colonialism, stuff that at first blush might not make a lot of sense, but the more time you spend around them, it, it, it really does uh, add up. Um, so kind of to that note, um, this is Sandra Katz. I visited him in Tennessee um, for a fermentation workshop that he holds um, every year. And people from all over the world showed up to learn about you know, fermentation and all sorts of methods. It often involves bacteria, but it also involves um, fungi. And here, for example, is a block of tempeh. Interestingly, Tennessee is uh, a kind of epicenter of tempeh in the United States. It's where um, it sort of got introduced to the American diet um, via the farm, which was like a commune, a hippie commune in the 70s. And it was their part of their vegan diet. Um, instead of, you know, cattle and livestock, they they dedicated their space to their land to, to soybean production, and they worked with this oligosporus. I forget the name of the strain, um, and they're still a provider of it. So it's an interesting kind of history there. But this was in uh, this was straight out of the incubator, so it's it's still alive in my hand, which is actually kind of profound, um, and it made me realize how little life is in the food I tend to eat. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so like I said, bacteria is key to it. That's a stained glass uh, window uh, botulism, I think he told me it was. So, um, you know, there's a reverence for, for the microbes in this space. And I actually kind of came to see the space as a fermentation vessel in itself, where people were learning from this guy who is... Um, kind of a guru figure uh, when it comes to fermentation, but I also witnessed him learning uh, a lot from them. And it really was an exchange, um, an exchange of techniques that allow you to extend the value of your food, uh, to preserve it, to enhance its flavor and its nutritional value. Um, and it was all being shared freely and uh, including by people who were like professional, you know, professionals in the food space. So there was this sort of, um, emphasis on uh, exchanging information and knowledge and building this culture uh, rather than on like keeping your secrets to yourself. And I found that pretty um, inspiring. And you can kind of see it reflected on his, uh, on his wall here. You've got phrases like, I will ferment myself. I will foment fermentation. Um, you know, th there are definitely social themes tied up in these practices. And, you know, there are people better equipped to unpack that than me. Um, you know, as far as the traditions go and, and, and whatnot, but I, I couldn't mistake those themes and I found them really compelling. 
speaking of social themes and, and radical concepts, um, this is at the Radical Mycology Convergence. Oh, and I should say one, one thing that I spoke to Sandra about was, um, you know, I've heard him talk about how like growing a tomato can be a radical act or fermenting and preserving your food can be a radical act. And I was kind of asking him how that is. And his answer was um, one that really stuck with me, which is basically in the context of a, society, of a system and in a society where uh, things are not equitable, things are not preserved, things are disposable, even something as simple or seemingly simple as that can be con considered a radical act. And I, I really took that with me. Um, but he, he doesn't kind of hold up radical as his brand as much as the radical mycology convergence, um, where the goal is definitely one of building a culture around some of these ideas and my co-culture as it's, it's called by its founder um, or one of its founders, uh, Peter McCoy. Um, fungal, there, there's an emphasis on broadening fungal literacy, advancing mycology as a citizen science, um, and leveraging that participation to make fungi uh, part of everyday life for as many people as possible. Um, part of that involves, again, just documenting local biodiversity. Um, this is the uh, now called fundus, formerly called um, uh, the myco, oh, I'm losing the name. Uh, I heard Michael Blitz earlier and it reminded me what they were called, but now I can't remember. But they're called Fundus now, the Fungal Distribution Survey. Um, and they are just trying to, you know, leverage people's interest in mushrooms to build out our picture of what's out there um, through citizen led collection efforts. Games were a big part of it. Um, this is uh, some game involving red jello that's meant to mimic the reproductive cycle. I don't really know how it worked. I just, uh, just saw the red jello and got a little freaked out. Um, but the uh, the idea here, they, they use the term do it together mushroom cultivation instead of do it yourself, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, the idea that this is a collective thing and that, that you know, if I know something, you should know it too. Uh, you know, I, I, there's no need to, to be proprietary about the knowledge of working with these organisms. Um, and that takes a cue, I think, from the psychedelic community. And, you know, you go to a site like Mycotopia uh, .net or um, shroomery.org, where you know people were developing and, and sharing methods or tech for growing psychedelic mushrooms. You know, over the last few decades, a lot of those techniques, and I think a lot of that culture is reflected in what you're seeing emerging in the kind of modern mycoculture. Um, again, each one teach one kind of concepts. Um, art show naturally. Um, that's the artist conk growing out of a birch. Base. <laughs> um, and uh, mycological societies popping up in places you might not expect, like Marfa. Um, if you're in Marfa, uh, look them up. Um, so, and I should say mycological societies, um, there's like traditional mycological societies, quote unquote, like those associated with NAMA, for example, um, that I think have really lent a lot of infrastructure to the sort of uh, foment that we're seeing now around fungi, which um, takes place in spaces like this and, um, you know, in, in people's basements and in, you know, far off campsites at, you know, sort of unaffiliated fungal gatherings that are, that are starting to become more common. Um, so there is kind of a, a mycoculture already, um, but there's a difference in focus and in themes. Um, you know, these social themes that I've been alluding to and mentioning are definitely more uh, central to the conversations in the, you know, the newer spaces and the younger spaces. Um, so that brings us to, oh, well, we found it, Mycotopia. Uh, that settles it. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. And I'm just kidding. Um, but this is at uh, Mushroom Mountain in uh, North Carolina. This is where Trad Cotter, um, who many of you have probably heard of, uh, kind of has his combination Willy Wonka, Jurassic Park, you know, fungal, uh, Mecca, um, where it's a it's a working um, mushroom farm. Him and and uh, Olga Cotter, his wife. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a it, it's a mushroom farm. It's a research center. It's an amusement park for anyone who's interested in fungi. You know, I think that's probably the coolest beer cooler I've ever seen. Um, those are spawn blocks, not the, not beers. And they also have a very um, well equipped lab um, where. Uh, and this is more, more on the Jurassic Park side, I guess. Um, they test 
fungi for all sorts of different capacities to break down various materials, to uh, deal with bacterial contaminations, uh, you know, basically you name it. Um, Trad has gotten a reputation as a mycological innovator. So like if someone sees a mushroom growing out of a bowling ball, they'll send it to him in hopes that maybe you can use that fungus to break down bowling balls in landfills or something. You know, it's broad strokes and it's easy to say, but that's the kind of uh, things they're looking for there. Um, you might notice the color of his hair. He jokes that it bruises that way. So he's, he's also interested in the, um, you know, the psychedelic dimension as well. I was doing some work in Jamaica to try to, uh, to build out, um, you know, so a source and a resource for people to, uh, engage with it in that way as well. But here it's mostly medicinal, um, remediation and also just mushroom farming. This is another cool example of what they're working on. Um, those are those exudates that I mentioned. They're collecting them in the corner of the bag. He's got this concept of, um, kind of patient specific fungal, uh, enzymes. So someone's sick with some sort of bacterial infection. The idea is if you know the fungus that works with that kind of bacteria, you take a sample from the patient, you, you inoculate it into the, or you introduce it into the, the fungal uh, substrate, the fungus responds to that um, bacteria with these enzymes that will kill it. And then you take those enzymes and in theory, introduce them back to the patient. And you've kind of got a quick turnaround patient specific enzyme, you know, profile. Again, easy to say, I don't know how the, you know, uh, the practicality of that really plays out, but it's fun to think about. And it's a kind of, you know, idea that, that really gets, gets your mind going. Um, and like I said, it's a mushroom farm. I just wanted to share this for anyone who grows mushrooms. I, I think it's a really cool idea. Um, I'd never seen this before or since each of those, these are, uh, I think oyster mushrooms. Um, each of the bags has been perforated where it touches the next bag. And so the mycelium of the two, within the two bags connects. And so each of those is basically a single wall of fungus that fruits at the same time, um, or in a much more kind of coordinated way um, than if they were all separated, um, which is just a cool idea. So I thought I'd share that with you. As before, you get a lot of these spent mushroom blocks, uh, again, in quotes, because you can see they're still producing tons of mushrooms. Um, they were kind of unsure what to do with all of them. And they were saying they might uh, donate them to a, a soup kitchen nearby. Um, I kind of like the Calvin vibe of the, the picture there, but um, those are all shiitake mushrooms on the mushroom trail that they have there with 30 different species. Um, and you'll see a little cordyceps uh, ant on the right there. It's the first one that he found. And uh, actually, it's not the first one he found. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, but it's, it's what people will see if they... Uh, if they go there, it's one of the first things they'll see. Um, and if you haven't heard of cordyceps, uh, go on and on about it because it's so crazy and cool and you've probably encountered them before, but they call them the zombie fungus, takes over the kind of motor functions of, of its insect victim, compels them to go to a spot above their you know, nest or their um, trails where their fellow insects are crawling and then it sprouts out, rains down spores and continues the cycle. Um, and we'll take another jump through space here to um, Pennsylvania. And that's another kind of cordyceps. That's cordyceps militaris. It's grown out of a moth pupa um, under the ground. And those are the hands of one William Padilla Brown, who is a young, I think 26 now, um, kind of rock star, mycological innovator, influencer. He has, he's part of a crew that has worked out how to cultivate these mushrooms, which like I mentioned, grow out of insects. And um, they are the basis of a lot of um, medicinal practice, traditional me medicinal practice, um, certainly in Asia. Um, but, uh, you know, cultivating them is not something that was really done here in the States. And he and his friends kind of cracked the code. Um, that's just a bunch of mushrooms they found at Microfest. Um, and they've kind of kickstarted a local or domestic, I should say, economy around cordyceps mushrooms. Um, as people without, you know, degrees in biology, without any formal education at all, as far as I know, um, they, uh, William calls himself a graduate of Google Scholar. Um, there you see Olga again on the right, and there's Trad, 
that's Brian Paul Gates um, on the left there, who's uh, who does amazing um, sculptures with uh, Ganoderma, uh, among other things. Um, this crew to me was really interesting, um, just group of people because they they're so obviously passionate about not just fungi but nature and kind of learning to work with them. Like one of you know William's other big projects is around um, spirulina and algae. And uh, kind of the idea of creating these closed systems, these like like engineering holistic reciprocal biological systems that also serve economic purposes um, for their communities. Um, he's got a lot of concepts around that that I encourage you all to look into. Um, but cordyceps is sort of the thing that that's really made him well known, and and I think it's his um, it's been his bread and butter for a while. Um, the uh, the methods that they developed involve genetic sequencing and involve lab techniques that, um, again, don't, you know, didn't exist before. Like he uses PCR, which is a, a way of sequencing, um, you know, the genes of a, a, a sample of a, a biological sample to identify the, the breeding type or the mating type so that he can breed them. So him and his friends, they all, they, they'll look for traits that they want in a, a given mushroom that they find in the field, they call it a pheno hunt. They're looking for phenotypes that they can mix and match, and get results that they would pref you know prefer if it's size or shape or color. Um, down the line, maybe they'll be looking at like different kinds of chemicals and enzymes that they produce. That's more involved and expensive process, but um, it's very reminiscent of what you'll see in cannabis. Um, and I've heard one of them mention that they think of cordyceps as kind of the new cannabis, which is an interesting concept. Um, they're also just really cool to look at. Um, it's kind of amazing that that's a, that's a living thing. Um, so, you know, it's with the, with, like I said, an emphasis on ecological perspectives. Um, they focus on ethical and sustainable harvesting, um, try not to nick the root of a tree when you're, you know, pulling it out of the ground with a, a knife because you don't want to infect the tree, working with local strains and specimens. Um, and kind of distributing the the effort, distributing the growth of these things, um, the cultivation of these things across the landscape. Um, so again, values uh, kind of inherent in all this that at certain times and in certain places become pretty explicit. Um, you know, sometimes people dance around, talk about like you know what what the mushrooms have to teach us and how we might like organize society, you know, to be more kind of like them but uh, some are pretty just on the nose. And so this is at the uh, New Moon Mycology Summit in Thurston, New York, uh, 2019. Um, and they're not mincing words. This is where fungi are the, the opportunity to talk about social issues. And this is uh, Mario Sabalos of the POC fungi community in uh, San Diego or unceded Kumie territory as, as you will hear. Um, and there in the, uh, the slide, you can see there, I don't, I don't see a single name of a single mushroom on there. I see capitalism, femicide, historical trauma, environmental racism, gender equality. I mean, there's an intersectional uh, conversation happening around fungi, which I found very interesting and maybe also not super surprising given fungi connect to everything and they aren't, you know, they are intersectional kind of in their being. There are a bunch of intersections happening. Uh, literally in the form of mycelium. And uh, that's Dr. Patty Kaishian on the left. She's um, giving a speech on her paper uh, on the queer science of mycology, which if any of you are interested, it's, um, I think it's been re renamed as the Science Underground. Um, so if you look up Dr. Kaishian, the Science Underground, you'll find that paper. It's pretty interesting. Um, she's now the curator of fungi uh, at Purdue, I believe. Um, she's a working mycologist, and she was speaking to how the be the way that fungi are and, and operate in the world um, is, you know, like we kind of alluded to before, you know, it's not binary. It's it's sort of queer, and in, in using sort of tech the technical term of queer there, um, and also in the way that the science is performed. Like a botanist might lay a transect down a canyon or something where. A, a mycologist has to kind of rely on intuition because mushrooms are ephemeral and fickle and you don't know when they're going to pop up. You don't even know what's out there the way that a botanist might. So um, yeah, I, I commend that paper to anyone who's curious about this stuff. Um, 
and it leads to these much more diverse um, groups that are increasingly starting to form around fungi. Um, you know, I think the spaces are still largely white male, um, and uh, but that's changing. And, and as I went through my travels, uh, I just saw more and more diverse uh, gatherings. Um, so it seems to me that fungi are kind of creating an opportunity for these spaces. And I, the conversations quickly go beyond fungi in the same way that if you're looking to fungi, you start looking to trees and you start looking to the soil and you start thinking about forests and you start thinking about the policies that lead to the forests looking the way they are. So it's not many steps from fungus to you know, social critique. And I find that really fascinating. Um, speaking of the POC fungi community, this is in San Diego, unceded Kumeyaay territory. Um, at the POC fungi community gathering um, early in 2020, shortly before the, uh, the lockdown started, actually. Um, and this was the most clear cut kind of example of what I'm talking about that I witnessed, where fungi were the reason for the gathering or the cause for the gathering, but they were not at the center of things as much as these conversations about um you know uh, indigeneity environmental racism um the uh, you know the, the narratives that are often left out of mycological spaces you know the native the, the the narratives of indigenous people they saw an opportunity to and, and around themes of medicinal mushrooms um specifically like psilocybin um you know which right there is a an easy example of these of where it's relevant because to a community of people who feel an ancestral connection to these uh, mushrooms, to the to their medicinal you know uses, um, they're talking about how as they become decriminalized and in fact legalized and celebrated for their therapeutic potential, the centers that are opening up and the industries that are emerging around it are likely to exclude them, um, and in fact to criminalize them disproportionately to the mostly white, mostly male folks who are going to benefit most from it, and so. Um, you know, again, it's not many steps from talking about mushrooms to talking about equity. Um, hence, you get, you know, this kind of conversation around mushrooms, um, something I think is good. Um, this is uh, also another example of kind of community-centered uh, economy. This is a uh, cordyceps tincture made by Snea Gangoli, um, grew and, and uh, extracted it herself. She even made the paper with mushrooms, that's a myco paper. Um, I forget which type of mushroom, unfortunately, but I think it's pretty cool. And to me, it was an example of how value can be created and circulated within a community rather than taken out. Um, and again, you see themes like environmental racism um, come up when you're talking about micro remediation, because if you're talking about contaminated landscapes, that's an issue that's going to affect communities of color more than others. So. Um, and food security, medicinal sovereignty, you know, these are issues that, that carry social weight with them. So um, I think we can look forward to more of this kind of intersectional conversation around mycology. Um, but to kind of drive the point home and to kind of conclude here, let's go to Ecuador. This is where, this is in Lago Agrio in the Sucumbios region where in the 60s um, oil was discovered by Texaco, now um, Chevron, where over the years of their operation, they dumped 18 billion gallons of toxic wastewater along with 17 million gallons of straight crude oil right into the rainforest. They claim that it's been addressed and remediated and it clearly has not. All you need to do is go there and you will see that that's not the case. Um, Elevated rates of cancers, skin rashes, birth defects, not to mention contaminated land, which makes farming next to impossible for a lot of people there who for a generation haven't even seen clean soil, you know, in their, uh, you know, on their land. So to me, this really puts the conversation about mushrooms saving the world into some perspective. The scale of the problems that we're dealing with and talking about are just simply staggering and, um, you know, despite this pretty grim scene, mushrooms are still growing and people are still, you know, living and thriving. And um, of course, microremediation has been brought up and people have gone down there and are still down there working to, to find ways of working with fungi among other, you know, microbes and other, you know, factors 
to address the issue. Um, but to me, there's a tension between those possibilities and, and the kind of solutionist mindset that I personally um, hope to, to challenge um, partly with my book. Um, this is Lexi Gropper. Um, she's one of the people that went down there with that mission in mind with the Amazon Micro Renewal Project, now called Co Renewal, which are still working there. They're also doing really interesting work in um, fire, post fire remediation in California. Um, Lexi is no longer working on that project, though. She has ended up becoming a full time resident there. She got married there. She's in love with the landscape and the people there. And, and her project now is less one of uh, micro remediation than of kind of social remediation. And to me, this is where things sort of emerge from all of this mushroom talk into the bigger picture and, and the point for me of, of uh, how we might work with mushrooms to save the world. Um, these are, are tinctures that she makes. They only grow mushrooms there now for, um, for medicinal purposes for the patients in the cancer clinics. Um, she won't sell them outside of the uh, it's their sole source of income, and they won't sell it outside of Ecuador because, as she said to me, uh, enough has already been extracted from Ecuador. Um, so, you know, in a in a place where like large scale micro remediation or remediation of any sort, um, not funded by the oil companies themselves, is unlikely to happen because it's a poor re like the poorest region in one of the poorest countries. Um, you, you, the scale at which that sort of thing would have to happen is is unlikely to to be realized. Um, so instead, she's working with local farmers to learn to assess the health of their soil just using visual techniques, um, which again is like the the fund literally the fundamental uh, issue. Um, and from there, she is part of a, a network of people who are trying to encourage uh, re sustainable, reciprocal, regenerative land stewardship throughout the region. Um, they've got a passport system, they've got like a Cosmo vision, they call it alignment chart, so that you can kind of place yourself on a spectrum and see where your, your work or your concepts as a land steward there might be intersect or, or be compatible with someone else nearby. Um, it's really fascinating work. And to me, it's a great example of how fungal fascination, you know, where it can and maybe should lead. Um, you know, if we pull our noses up from the ground from looking at mushrooms, um, we can see the other issues to which they connect. And the solutions to these issues aren't likely going to be an innovation or an invention, but kind of in recognizing where and how we can change the ways we relate to the landscape and to one another. Um, and if there is a real mycotopia, I would say that kind of describes it. Um, so can mushrooms save the world? It depends on what we mean. Um, the mushrooms will almost certainly be fine no matter what we do. Um, the planet to the planet or to one another. They've been around for over a billion years after all, um, and they'll probably be around a lot longer than we will. So what we're really asking with that question, I think, is whether we can save it or whether they can save it for us. And at the end of the day, that's up to us. So with that, uh, I will conclude. And thank you very much for listening. Awesome. That was so beautiful. Um, yeah, especially there at the very end, I got all like, just started really thinking about that whole project because the, you know, the whole oil spill and everything, um, because like that is one of the four most fights in like, you know, uh, extractive colonialism or, you know, just more or less just general, regular U.S. imperialism because one of the human rights lawyers that was hired for that uh, to represent the Ecuadorian people in that case, Stephen Donzinger, has been <coughs> is currently being prosecuted. And, you know, it's a very complicated story uh, that I'm not going to get into right now because like this uh, kind of is very this part of it is very tangential to what we're talking about. But um, so but, you know, I think he, he was on the majority report. Chapo Trap House did a couple episodes with him. Google Stephen Donzinger and one of those shows and you'll find the whole story. But uh, Chevron, basically the the U.S. Uh, Department of Justice has allowed Chevron to uh, hire a private prosecutor and and do all and has a very you know biased judge and all this uh, really, really um, in, insane stuff. So uh, to to keep him from being able to represent the Ecuadorian people and carry out the the 
the sentence that was handed down in that case, which Chevron lost. So they are been ordered to pay millions and million, billions of dollars in remediation f- to help, you know, fix the water problem as best they can down there, um, things like that. And yeah, so they're going after him um, for that. And um, it's uh, it's it's pretty wild. And it just I think is a it's it's a very uh, it's an indicator of to the lengths of the, the scale of that they'll go to in order to like um, <laughs> keep the things going, you know, keep their money flowing the way it's been flowing and, uh, you know, and not take responsibility for any of their, um, the damage that they've caused. And so it's, um, yeah, it's just, yeah, that whole th- situation down there is a big mess, and I'm glad the the co renewal project has people, you know, working with the people there to kind of help clean up that mess and help teach the people ways that they can um, further communicate the extent of the problem. Because I feel like you know, the more they have a voice down there, uh, the more justice they're going to be able to receive. Because you know, it's it's extremely extremely terrible what happened down there. Um, yeah, so I, th- we actually have a couple books to give away, uh, a couple copies of the book to give away. Um, Chelsea Green Publishing was nice enough to, to hook us up with a couple copies. So I think, um, we, I, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Angel, do you want to come back up and I can I know I kind of derailed us with the m- mentioning the <laughs> Stephen Donzinger case, but, uh. No problem. Important stuff to talk about. Um, yeah, uh, I we didn't mention at the beginning, but uh, we'll do kind of like a pop quiz. Um, and so we have some folks on YouTube also. And um, so the way that it would work is the first first person to type it into the chat and we'll have to kind of cross reference i think on your side phil right don't you see like everybody's comments combined yeah i can see everything okay so i'm gonna ask everything (laughs) okay good (laughs) um i'm gonna ask a question and the first person to uh respond in the chat will get a copy and so we ask, We also have, we have two copies, so we'll ask one question now, and then we'll ask one near the end after our discuss, discussion. So get your QWERTY keyboards ready. And so the first question, and the first person to type it in will win a copy of Doug's new book. What is the name of the Myco Collective in which Doug began his search for Mycotopia? Oh yeah, I think that's correct. It's it's Smugtown, right? Yeah. There you go. I hope I got that right, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was just realizing I didn't mention it, but yeah, they they're part of what's called the Mycelium Underground, and I should have mentioned that in the beginning. But uh, that's another collective. Smugtown is the the name of uh, Olga's uh, group. That's for sure. Oh. I just All learned right. about that when reading that section in your book. I had no idea things had evolved that much. That was one thing that I really got. So, oh, by the way, congratulations to Danny. He nailed it. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Danny, if you could just uh, um, uh, uh, just private message your email and address where you want the books and we'll get that over to you. But uh, like I was saying, reading the parts that I was able to, to get a chance to get around to reading in the book, it was like getting a chance to like read a little bit about some of what my friends are doing and in the micro community and acquaintances that I've made and um, and even learn about some some new stuff, too, like the uh, the bark beetle I found that was really interesting. And because you, you kind of brought it up in your little presentation earlier, but um, how... It, and it, it, her explanation, Dr. Six's explanation, just made a lot of sense. It was like, no, this is – because I, I work with trees, you know, for a living. That's what, kind of my day job. So I kind of understand where she was coming from with that, with, like, 
there's a threshold that the tree gets to when it's like damaged or whatever that it can't ever recover from and that has little to do with the fungus growing in it it has you know more to do with the beetles attacking it and then the fungus is kind of takes advantage of that like degraded state and the tree just can't keep up with all of that um, and then yeah. like things like climate change and whatnot can could potentially exacerbate those issues but it made a lot of sense that like you know if if you know let left alone that the trees that do survive will eventually you know re-inhabit the forest and they'll have a greater resistance to the beetle themselves so it's just fascinating and it's um yeah bringing that ecological approach is so important to have because it gets it uh it gets looked over um because people really have that linear look at things i think exactly i was just going to say to me it's like a an example of how linearity gets in the way of understanding what's actually happening. Um, and we think of things as like threat A to subject B, you know, or subject tree, but uh, it's more complicated than that. And um, maybe not even as, uh, as bad as we might think it is. I think the one, one sure way to become a subject of intense scrutiny is to, you know, pose a, a threat to timber board feet. So, you know, it makes sense that the, yeah. The assumption was that, oh, it's got to be just bad for it. And I think that also is kind of why uh, mycology has kind of existed in this more underground state as like a culture uh, for DI in the DIY realm and kind of relegated from more intense academi academic study just because, um, you know, the most of the focus has been on like, how does this affect timber production? How does this affect... Uh, crop production and we're focused on plant pathology around that yep. instead of just like trying to understand excuse me fungi fungi uh and their you know habitat ranges the way we understand plant ranges and i think like hmm. you mentioned earlier that comes down to like the fact that like you have to be really kind of lucky to catch fungi fruiting um uh at the right time because yeah. you know and if anybody yeah, has any questions, stuff. feel free to ask them too. And people can jump on and ask, join yeah. the conversation if they want to. Anyway, sorry, Doug, I jumped in on you. A, a question, sort of related to some things that are timely. And, you know, I was reading POC Fungi's post today about, you know, the um, ethnogen or psychedelic mushrooms becoming, um, you know, like uh, in California, there's been some some bills passed. Um, so this is sort of going into another topic. Um, but, uh, you know, like there's like within this, like, you know, and this conversation comes up a lot in like the younger kind of communities um, around mycology, but the, um, you know, you, you have all of these, you know, people like Peter Thiel wanting to like synthesize and like sort of like uh, commodify sacred mushrooms. And, you know, uh, you know, there seems to be, you know, it just, it just feels uh, like <laughs> sort of like dystopian. <laughs> Totally. You know, um, <laughs> like, and it's inevitable in the way that, you know, POC fungi community described it, like within the construct of our power structure that we're, we live underneath. Um, and, you know, it doesn't seem like we're anywhere near dismantling that structure, you know, um, and, you know, during this period of COVID, that structure has gotten increasingly more powerful, like exponentially, like, I mean, it's in sort of overdrive. So, you know, everyone gets excited, and, you know, even in Texas, like there was a bill that's, I'm pretty sure it's going to pass to allow, um, you know, it's sort of these like band-aid sort of things, like let's, let's just throw some, um, you know, psychedelic at, at PTSD vets and, and let Baylor or whoever, like university, do some research and try to, you know, help these people. Um, 
but yeah, I just, uh, like, were, was there, I'm sure you encountered a lot of things like this, that just like, it felt kind of dystopian, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I tend to like veer more into the, and that's sort of why I go outside a lot is to like, try to like find the like bright end of, you know, it's why I'm part, part of this community is like, it pulls me out of that like mindset. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate that it like, you know, so, as soon as you start talking about the stuff that's like really, or some of the stuff that's really exciting in you know, these conversations and these subjects, it inevitably kind of leads you to the, the dystopian uh, scenery in which it's all taking place. And, and I think that's, you know, inevitable. And I, I again, it's about our context and, um, you know, I wish I had a, you know, a really hopeful note to, to contribute on it, but the only hopeful thing to me that, I mean, and it really is kind of the, the, it ends up being the thesis of the book, if there is one, it's that we have to come to recognize that and we can't be caught up in these kind of Pollyanna solutionist, you know, narratives about mushrooms saving us, you know, or um, anything saving us. And, and it, it comes down to really being clear-eyed about the the nature of the problems we face or the you know uh, maybe doing a disservice to the word nature there you know but it's uh yeah like uh, i mean seeing the the forest ravaged the way that i did you know not necessarily just by the bark beetles but by the fires um you know i talked to some people too who were were definitely like you know motivated by profit more than necessarily you know trying to change the world in a in a positive way, or, or maybe that was secondary at best to the, to that goal. And you know, the, the, there was tension there that I observed. But um, I came away feeling really really hopeful that like there's this dimension of the natural world that's so fundamental and, and ubiquitous and um, you know un, unstudied, unknown. Um, we we're just getting acquainted with it really. And it's also becoming uh, inspiration for conversations that really challenge the status quo and, sta and challenge that context that we're talking about. And so my hope is to encourage that. And you know, maybe mushrooms will be a spark for broader conversations and we won't be talking about mushrooms anymore, um, but it will have contributed to that broader conversation. So you know, that's the most hopeful kind of tack I can take on that. <laughs> um, but I also happen to think it's true. I don't think I'm not making that up. You know, I really do believe that. Yeah, I mean, the dystopian thing, uh, it rings really true to me. Um, and I think like kind of the perspective that I know some indigenous communities have, and it's probably fairly widespread, but like, you know, when settler colonialism was really, was just totally ravaging their communities, like they view that as like, you know, the in it in very much was the end of their world in a lot of ways. So like, they're living in like a post-apocalyptic uh, <laughs> landscape. And I think kind of what we are you know as white settlers you know benefiting off of this system is we're kind of waking up to this recognition of that like that devastation of you know the land and our and our relation and when i say our i just mean like the human being's relationship to that uh to the land um which i think it really helps put it in perspective um but i also like just learning and studying ecology and the succession of of ecosystems and such um and i think that many of the indigenous people would also agree with this that like once you kind of repair your relationship with within that ecosystem uh things you know will start to align and it, they will heal really quickly because it's like that is you know that that is just the nat natural state of things like if you think about like when a volcano explodes and it covers the whole field in basalt whatever eventually for, uh, forces of you know physics and chemistry act upon it and soil builds and you know we're actually at a point where like soil builds relatively quickly because there's the microbes that are those primary succession microbes uh, and you know algae and fun you know fungi bacteria f uh, lichens and all that they move in really quickly um, and they you know they start that process of you know healing you know of, a, of the ecosystem again uh, really quickly um, and I do think that you're right um, that Doug that the um, that fungi are a really good bridge for having conversations uh, that can align people with like what 
uh, in a you know a, a school of, uh, of analysis that I like that I uh, I don't know political analysis that I enjoy is uh, social ecology you know kind of founded by Murray Bookchin and the, and the, the uh, you know kind of teaching people they teach people about it at the institute for social ecology but the the concept of like first nature which is like you know the nature of survival trees plants eating drinking water those kinds of things you know um and you know those are like kind of the first nature and then there's the second nature which is like human culture all the behaviors and things that we uh are you know that we learn that we teach each other and how we get along how we get through the world through the things that we learn and how we meet our first natural needs you know through second nature and what we need to do as like a social movement or people who want to deal with this problem is kind of, is reconcile our understanding uh <clears throat> and reconcile our second nature the nature of culture or you know our cultural components with first nature um and you know there's going to be some elements of going back and you know downscaling but also um you know, moving through to a whole new way of like sharing and relating to the ecology as we move forward. Just, I think, because one, the technology is there and uh, to to do that. And like people should have the right to have certain developmental standards of living, but that don't that don't need to be tied to, um, you know, the motive of profit, which I think it drives all the ecological damage. But um and then I yes, a scaling back of it too. Pond in braiding sweetgrass. I didn't get that far, oh, but yeah. that book is another kind of one of those uh, points, or one of these that really kind of spoke to me about what I uh, and like helped solidify some of what I was just you know speaking on. Uh, put yeah, those, put that those book is. That book is a, a masterpiece. I think that's that, that's referring to the, the the chapter where she's just over the course of I think months or years just kind of dredging uh, weeds and things out of this this pond in what seems like a, a completely futile um, you know effort. And it it's my takeaway from it, at least from my memory, is that it's about playing a role, and that you know it's not it doesn't have to be like leave the system alone you know, the ecosystem or extract from it. Um, both of those tend to otherize us from the systems of which we're part. Like we aren't really separable from any of it. You know, it, 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 it endlessly, uh, you know, uh, entangled uh, to use that word again. And, uh, you know, we can, pl- we play roles and the kinds of roles we're going to play are, are really determines the outcome. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful metaphor for that. Um, but I won't try to step on Dr. Kimmerer's words because they are perfect as they are. Yeah, that is, I need to finish that book. I have a problem with starting books that I don't finish. Um, <laughs> but that, yeah, that Me book too. was just like, and I think part of why I was just like so hyped on reading it and it was just like confirming a lot of things that, you know, personal beliefs that I had kind of built up through my interactions with the world and studying this stuff. And um, and that's like another thing, like you were talking about um the study of evolution earlier and the the genetic relationships and like uh, that really cool study that I want to look into a little bit more about uh, studying the supercontinent and the divide and the speciation due to that divide of the continents, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, yeah. It's just so fascinating to me. Um, yeah. It's crazy to think that we could, you know, detect that in a genetic record you know, but genes yeah. tell a story. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes me want to dedicate a bunch of time to learning all that stuff again, even because I've never really <laughs> never learned it thoroughly in like undergraduate high school stuff. And uh, but it it is such an important story uh, that relates to us all. And like and it's also a story of how we are that web. Um, and that we've forgotten our place within that web, uh, because, yeah. like, yeah, we just totally forgot that. You know, we, it's a very common idea, and it, I have I gotten into some pretty I don't know heated arguments with people sometimes, it's friends, about like 
no, you're not separate from nature. Like the concept of wilderness as we have it in like the Western society is really flawed because like what if you go outside, like there are wild elements that live, even if you're in a highly urbanized environment, like it's, I think more accurate to think about it as like a heavily disturbed ecosystem or an ecosystem that's severely out of balance as opposed to like yeah. not wild. And, I, and for me, when I bringing that concept of like, well, when I walk outside my door, even though I'm in the city uh, and that being a wild place, like brings a whole new perspective on like, how should I relate to this place that I'm in and living in? Yeah. Yeah, that's something that's been on my mind lately too. Is how like being in a city feels like you're like like we we say let's get out to nature when we're in the city, as though we're not in nature when we're in the city, and you know we do a lot of work as a species to kind of um, you know make that distinction and to build that wall, as it were, and maybe with good reason. I mean, it's understandable because you know prior we know a lot more about nature now, despite you know otherizing it the way we have than we used to. It, it's a formidable foe, you know, there are aspects of, of nature can be a formidable foe if we, you know, allow it to be fungi included. So it's not, you know, it's not like we'd all be holding hands and dancing around a rainbow. If we just dropped the, the capitalism or whatever, we still right. have to contend with nature, even though we're part of it. But I like the idea that like, I mean, just thinking of like these indigenous concepts that uh, having uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer and on my mind again is like and, and is, is kind of making me think of like how much I appreciate the use of certain words to like characterize these things and so you know we talk about like oh it's all connected and, and fungi teach us about how things connect um, I, I really like the idea of like thinking of it as relations instead and that's something you hear a lot of people in, in indigenous communities talk about our relations with our more than human relatives you know um, and it's something incidentally that's revealed in our understanding of the genetic, you know, uh, lineage and our common ancestry with every other living thing. Um, they are literally our relatives. So it's like, again, there's wisdom that's being proven now in our, our, you know, supposedly advanced age, right. um, that's been part of the discourse for a long time, but now we're starting to kind of come around to it. And I feel like, yeah, the whole fungi thing is is part of a recognition. I, I say this in the book, like I think part of why people are getting so um, animated about fungi and interested in them is down to, again, the context, like things are, wrong, are going wrong. We all recognize that things need to change. And here's this like, you know, giant uh, aspect of, of the world that has been around and within us all along that we haven't recognized, and it's just specifically speaking about fungi, that is like shaking us into awareness of these deeper relations and um, these shared, you know, our shared condition and our reciprocal reality. Um, it makes perfect sense to me that the people are getting really interested in fungi these days because like we need to shake our thinking loose of some bad patterns and, and they seem well positioned to help us do that. So that's what I hope to encourage. Yeah. Angel, did you want to? Oh, she disappeared. Um, okay, so that yeah, the relations thing. That's a that's I think like a, one of the fundamental misunderstandings people have about like what Marx is saying is he's like talking about the relationship people have with each other through or like the the way uh, capitalism develops material goods. It dictates the way we relate to one another and how like it's now. At this, you know, what people call the most a really advanced stage of it, it's like it's really hard to see how uh, our lives aren't mediated by commodities. I think some of the most uh, profound examples of that are obviously like housing and you know paying rent to somebody, renting out, uh, you know, relating to the landlord through the commodity of um, through the housing uh, through the house or apartment or and you know same thing with healthcare. You know, having that be commoditized, uh, you know, creates a certain relationship dynamic that would exist differently. And it, it does exist differently in other parts of the world where they have different systems. Like in Cuba, their healthcare system is based on like local doctors as a primary care physician. You go see the doctor as quickly as you feel like something's wrong because, you know, come to find out, you know, that's the most efficient way to deal with health care, health issues. It saves a lot of money on resources. And like that way you only have people needing to go 
in for expensive tests whenever the doctor has determined, you know, says like, oh, this is serious. Go. You need, whereas like here in the United States, like usually people end up at that point because they have they've been putting it off because they couldn't afford that and the, the, uh, an early detection. And so they end up, uh, you know, having to need the most expensive route of care just because like they weren't able to intervene early on. So we got another. It's funny how what, oh, go ahead. what's most equitable tends to also be what's um, uh, the most efficient. <laughs> right. And that's like, <laughs> I think, I know I kind of been really harping on my anti capitalism tonight, but like, there's like an axiom that I th think really rings true is that uh, if it's not profitable under capitalism, it's not going to get done. Like, that's just not where the priorities lie. And I think like once we uh, are able to, you know, set different social priorities because like make no mistake about it the fun fund foundational uh principle that guides our society is the profit motive and until we fundamentally uproot that from our society like that's there's that's this is the course that it's on that's why i say like we don't need to they're the democrats and the republicans who don't want to fundamentally change that they're the accelerationists in the situation because they are accelerating the uh, decline of our global ecology by just sitting idly by and living in a fantasy about it. No. So I'm rambling. I agree <laughs> with that. I agree with that for sure. Man. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got another question, it. Angel. Yeah. So um, should we maybe allow YouTube? to catch up and somebody from YouTube. Yeah, a let's, let's, uh, this one will I go to the YouTube. I think that's a good idea, but it's like a, th okay. a three minute lag or something like that. <laughs> it's, 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 lag. it's not, I don't know about three minutes, but it's, okay. it's significant, but, uh, I, yeah, YouTube speak up when y'all okay. will get a, yeah, we'll, we'll just keep chatting and we'll wait for YouTube to chime in. So, so last question to win a copy, a physical copy of Doug's book. Uh, what is the type of mushroom that Doug first cultivated? Do you like these questions, Doug? Oh, yeah. Are they too easy? I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I would get them right. <laughs> He's got to go check his presentation. Yeah. <laughs> it, it might kind of be a trick question, actually, now that I think about it. Angel must have wrote down the answers. <laughs> I was taking notes, mental notes. No one can uh, crib them from you. <laughs> All right, we're watching you, YouTube. In the meantime, for those of us who don't win a book, where where's the best place to buy one? Oh well, I mean, I would sit, I would have to say your your local bookstore, you know, your local independent bookstore. Um, hopefully, they're carrying it. I know a lot of them are, but if not, um, you know, I'm I'm going to suggest everything I can before Amazon. So there's Bookshop.org. There's uh, the publisher themselves. You can get it straight from them, Chelsea Green. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's also at Barnes and Noble. I'm going to try to get it in. We're going to try to get it into our libraries if it's not there already. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it has been showing up at a number of libraries, which is really cool to see. Okay. Austin libraries are like super good. So if yeah, they don't already them. have it, they'll want to get it. <laughs> All right, I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> see, I'm trying to see any there's any questions in the chat here yeah this one said um as far as the the mushroom the type of mushroom blue button i've never heard of blue button but it sounds like a good good one yeah i haven't heard of that either i'd eat a blue button yeah it just sounds tasty in the or not. yeah i might just eat a blue button off of a sweater <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what they were trying to say. I, I mean, feel free to guess again out there on YouTube. But I think I know what they were trying to say. Um, and I feel like it's close.
Is it black pearl? I'm, I'm looking for a general category too. So it could be like a reishi or a, a lion's yeah. mane or an oyster or a shiitake or any one of those kind of thing that would work. Yeah. Because it was definitely clear with the morphology that it was a certain type. We'll see how many. Uh, now, here's the question. Is it the first the mushroom? I have a question about the question. Was it the first <laughs> mushroom? That I that I cultivated or that I grew at home. Oh, so What's grew the at home. Grew at home. Okay, yeah. The one that you showed the picture of. Right. Well, I showed two. That's why I'm I'm not sure this is oh, kind of a trick question. There's there's one that I took home. Close enough attention. There's one that I took home and grew, and then there's one that I cultivated myself. Like I got the straw from a horse farm, and it sprouted on the okay. day that I uh, I signed so the book. I was. Deal. So someone just came out with the oyster, and that's mm -hmm. what I was looking for. Okay, did I, that is the first I, one that I cultivated at home, yeah. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Okay, the first, yay. Well done, yeah. The first one that I grew at home was the Rishi from uh, Smug Tank, but I didn't cultivate that, so. Yeah, Angel, that's me, and I'm cheating because I'm on both. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You're straddling time and space. <laughs> 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 was it a yellow oyster it wasn't yellow it you said yellow. yellow you said oyster i think feel like that counts as close enough it was oyster but it wasn't uh, yellow but i don't know if that matters well it did have a kind of and you know in the picture it did have a kind of yellow hue but it it, it was you showed a pretty a it was pretty little too i remember right it, it wasn't was, even fully yeah, it was primordial yet. yeah yeah so what should we I should see. we ask a different question? Doug, do you want to ask a question? Oh gosh, I you, don't think yeah. I have to test the audience how well they paid attention. Oh, Though gosh. YouTube yeah. can just rewind and go find the answer. They can like listen on two and a half speed and or and then you know to find it real quick. I can show the picture again and then it could just be a what kind of mushroom is this kind of game. But um gosh, I don't know. I haven't thought about how to quiz people on my slideshow. That's a <laughs> There's a lot maybe, of maybe I should material in there. Hmm. I I was even almost thinking of something that was like really open ended. So <laughs> yeah, like what is the thesis hmm. of this book? <laughs> <laughs> Did do you think find the... Mycotopia? <laughs> what do you think the politics of this guy are? <laughs> um. Boy, yeah, putting me on the spot here. I'm actually opening the slideshow up again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, does that, did they not, you don't think that counts as like a a win? They also said it with a question mark, so they weren't necessarily confident. And then they guessed again, too. Uh, so I don't know. They okay. can maybe appeal well, how about in the this? chat if what? they want to. I got you know, one. You could, you could appeal. Oh, you got a question. Go for it. What's the, um, what's the, uh, Oh, I think I might have lost it. <laughs> I had a good one. Um, I'll be able to say it once I see the picture. It was in my head. Uh, but now I'm looking at all the pictures and I've confused myself. Oh yeah, yeah. What was the uh, what was the the type of mushroom that was in liquid culture and it was like reaching for the top of the jar? I don't remember that one? Ooh. That one's tricky. <laughs> I can even show you the picture again. Yeah, do that. Yeah, show All the right. picture. All right. uh, Are um, you out there, YouTube? Pay attention. <laughs> you ever drink liquid culture? Is that a thing? I think I you wouldn't. could. It probably. <laughs> Not Doug's face says no. <laughs> Would you drink that? That one has been sitting around for a while. I've definitely had a jar do that on me. Where they crawl up the side and they trying to reach they're reaching for the air <laughs> which is pretty fun well, yeah i was wondering like so it, it can't be airtight then if that's happening well if you um, kind of see at the very top there on the you can see uh, on the lid there's a little puff and that's a poly yeah. fil that's a polyfill filter so like pillow oh, stuffing right, right, filter right. and that's like um 
uh, yeah, it's um, it's to allow oxygen to exchange. allow air to flow in there because they need a little bit of air, fresh air exchange, and that's also another reason why you agitate. It you know it helps them grow exponentially, but it adds mixes some air into the liquid again because they're like, right. you know, they're breathing it out, taking it out of the. Um, and then I people on the YouTube cool were saying, uh, I guess lion's mane, and then it doesn't say in the presentation. It was lion's mane. Uh oh. It was lion's it's lion's mane. mane. Yeah. That's the correct yeah, guess. YouTube, you got this. Um, you didn't. I get thought it was cool that it kind of looks like a mushroom cloud almost coming kind of like. up. Wait, right. is that? Who's that going to? Deanna, YouTube. Deanna I'm gonna YouTube. ask her to email us our her um, address. Well done. That's good memory. I'm gonna say I just kind of like glanced over that detail, but they remembered. Oh. Uh, how do I? Sorry, Garza, you had to hop on YouTube for that second question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll buy them in bulk yeah, at some you, point, you, though, Chris. Yeah. Send a high faith thread over to YouTube. <laughs> now they're just guessing mushrooms over there in the. <laughs> oh, Wait, <laughs> Chris Garza won our first like little giveaway, didn't didn't you, Chris? For the Halloween event that we had. Yeah, I won one. I won the cordyceps tincture. I still have some. Nice. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I feel a little less bad then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no worries. This is fun. I should try to do this with every uh, presentation I give. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention, folks. To get people, yeah, <laughs> people probably would have had an easier time if I'd have remembered to uh, to mention that we would be giving the books away. <laughs> so you need to pay attention. We could also do like audio book copies in your giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read the book to you. <laughs> <laughs> Doug will read you to sleep at night. <laughs> I think that's probably the likely outcome. <laughs> 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 no, it's a very like like it was it it was very interesting to read about a community that I had like been on the inside of from someone who is like trying to communicate it to people who are completely on the outside of it. It's like right. I was mentioning earlier. It's like oh, I you know I know these people. I know you know. And so it was really cool to just, like see re, you know read their thoughts about you know the broader micro community and to kind of get get like a you know, a thousand, a meta view of it, if you will. Cause like, I love getting really wild, uh, wide, um, really wide perspectives on things. Cause I think that mm -hmm. kind of helps get a, also give perspective yeah. on what happens in the very immediate. I have a question. So did this originally start as like, maybe like a, cause you do a, editorial content for like like short shorter articles right yeah um so did you maybe start this like like your entry into this world did it start with just like an article and then it turned into a book yeah basically that's exactly how it happened um i had uh i had seen the ted talk that i mentioned the, the ted uh, almost called him ted stamets <laughs> um the uh the uh yeah the famous talk and that kind of like put it on my radar and i was like whoa this is all crazy stuff and then um i actually interviewed him for a, a tech magazine because i used to be i used to write mostly about like technology and media and stuff i think because i was like looking for like solutions you know for hope and uh I got really disillusioned with that whole space and through a weird series of events i got hooked up with a food magazine and i started kind of writing about food related subjects and one of my first stories I had mushrooms on the mind. It was like, oh, this is an interesting subject. And I heard about Smugtown and the kind of struggles they were having. Cause it, again, like profit wasn't like the driving consideration there. And, and I went up there on that trip and all the pictures that I showed today were from that trip um, mm -hmm. 
for an article. I think the headline was something like this anti-capitalist mushroom company needs a business plan, but it doesn't want one, or something mm -hmm. like that. And then I did a profile of the radical mycology convergence 2018. So those two articles are really kind of what's started it. Um, and those, those, uh, are, those are reflected in the book. Like if you read the articles, you'll see that they're very, like they're from the same visits. Um, so they're in the book and yeah, it was just kind of a crazy, like not a coincidence necessarily, but through another connection, I ended up writing a review and an interview with Leah Penniman of uh, Soul Fire Farm, who is an amazing, just amazing person doing amazing work. And that book that she wrote was published by Chelsea Green. And so they saw that article. They read my other stuff on this mushroom you know, scene and then said, we think there might be a book here if you'd like to propose it. And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. And I think I would. So um, yeah. I kind of got the invitation to, to do a book on it if I could you know, pull a proposal together. So I might not have proposed it if I hadn't been invited to because it's such a, a long shot usually to get published you know so um i had a good likelihood that it would get picked up and um that's why it happened so lucky basically i feel really grateful yeah. about that yeah i definitely relate on the disillusion with the tech that's the world i came out of oh yeah but yeah that was the same you know it's like around every corner everybody's saving the world yeah exactly and they're yeah. selling you something at the same time weird yeah <laughs> exhausting but but yeah yeah i love to he hear stories like that i think that uh that i think it came out like about a year ago that book chaos about the um oh gosh it was about the um like someone started writing an article in the 90s and then it turned into uh, this book um, on uh, the Charles Manson murders. Whoa. But I'm, yeah. But, I know um, the one by like James Collect, which is like about the the chaos theory, but I don't know about the, that's a different yeah, kind of chaos. <laughs> it's like the CIA, the secret history of the 60s. Oh, um, yeah. So it digs into like MK Ultra, like LSD, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. And it's written by uh, Tom O'Neill. Tom O'Neill, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he started. You know, he I think that it was like a twenty, thirty year <laughs> article, basically. Wow, well, I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, is there anything that, because I know, you know, during creating something like what you created, I know we've been kind of going a while. We'll wrap up here soon. Um, but um, I know, like, creating something like you created in this book, like, there's a lot that goes into it and a lot that gets cut. What is there anything that you had to cut that you, like, understood that it needed to be cut, but you wish that you could have uh, left in, but it, you know. Is there anything mm -hmm. like that that kind of sticks out in your mind? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wanted to put the uh, the, the Myco Alliance stuff in there. Um, it just wasn't, it couldn't, for editorial reasons and right. flow reasons, just wasn't going to work. But I thought it was a cool, like a really cool remediation example. And it, all, it summed up like so much of what I was looking for, which is like these, this kind of pedagogy, these communities, this amateur interest purging into like, practical you know um work with fungi and stuff there was that there was a i visited um when i was in the uk i mentioned the art show which i thought was a pretty interesting um scene i talked to the curator of it and stuff and, and that kind of like more uh i don't know how to put it high income kind of level of the the interest that like i think is a lot more sort of aesthetic and focused on fashion and um, I was hoping to kind of have that in there by con for some contrast. And also there's uh, a situation in um, Epping Forest specifically, as well as other um, areas of land in the UK where there's a lot of concern about over foraging for mushrooms because it's becoming extremely popular. Um, and there's like a lot of disputes over 
whether it's a, a worthy concern, um, whether it should be illegal the way that it is. You know, on the one hand, you got people who are like, you're picking mushrooms, you're not pulling mycelium out of the ground, it's fine. On the other hand, you've got people who are like, there are restaurants that are just like ravaging the ecology here. And so we have to tamp down on, on like recreational mushroom foraging. And so I went to Epping Forest and, and saw a bunch of mushrooms and talked to some people, but um, I thought that would have been a cool detail to include, but you know, just the, the structure of the book is sort of flowing and kind of, um, I mean, it, it's just sort of like rolls into the next kind of idea and set of ideas. And so, um, you know, I had to kind of find the path that made sense for that. And that meant cutting out stuff like that. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed the way the book flowed and everything and I'm looking forward to finishing it up. Um, and it is also like something too, I kind of like skipped around chapter to chapter and you could also read the book that way too. It seemed to make huh. as much sense that way. Cause I like read the first couple chapters and I was like, Oh, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, Cause I like did a name search actually look, <laughs> see if central Texas mycology popped up or I know we had spoke on the phone. I wonder if my name popped up. So, uh, and um, it does, it does. Yeah. I was really happy with where, it, how it popped up too. You get, nice. you get associated yeah. with uh, talking about marks. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the Myco Fest, that was and that was such a fun time, and that's you know where we we met too, and yeah. a lot of, you know how this society also kind of grew out from that meeting too, because that's where Angel and I met right. <laughs> also, and that's even awesome. though she lives in li lives in Austin and I live thirty minutes south, like that's where. Well, I, I did. I want. I as soon as I saw your talk, I was like, I have to make sure this gets into the book because it was like. Uh, it would to me it was like yeah okay this is really i'm not making this up or i'm not imagining this like these connections are here yeah. it's like social critique and mycology are like are connected and, and you were putting such a like point on it it's like <laughs> well, you know, seizing the means of locomotion for the uh you know the cordyceps ants and stuff like i well, loved it i mean the kind of the impetus behind that talk was like we're talking like we, there's so like kind of what you had kind of recognized you know all these metaphors that existed and like but then people were talking about like starting like sole proprietorship farms you know there's nothing necessarily wrong with that but also like some of these businesses get to be relatively sized large sizes with employees and so it just seemed like a good opportunity to like if we're going to be talking about you know reinventing our communities and you know around fungi to also kind of bring up the aspect of like shared uh, ownership and kind of kind of bringing that back into the conversation um and then so they uh, yeah i just kind of wanted to ask a little bit about stuff that kind of got had left out but uh they're asking some questions about the logo in the youtube chat that is a um a uh, texas star mushroom the um coriastis geaster uh and that's yeah like what is well said is on track to be the the state mushroom of texas angel do you want to kind of right. tell the story about that no. yeah sure um so i believe it ha like the or origination like the sort of concept and idea like happened or uh, at within the myco research station the myco alliance bolts and um like right before covid we were chatting with some other people in Central Texas that are, you know, myco enthusiasts. Um, and one woman, Kathy, she was very enthusiastic about, you know, um, spending the time like knocking on doors, finding sponsors. And, you know, in Texas, we only have uh, the legislature only meets every two years. So to try to like get your bill in and get things done it's like you got to be very sort of timely and opp opportunistic so um so yeah so kathy and um found sponsor a sponsor in the house they passed it in the house and then another woman actually a republican woman who is the person that's also responsible for the bill that will make it legal for um you know it's uh, psychedelics to be used for PTSD research for veterans. She also sponsored the bill um, to make the Texas star mushroom, the official mushroom of Texas. And so um, 
for those that don't know, so like this particular species, it is only found in, you know, the sort of central Texas area up to like the border of Oklahoma, from what I've uh, seen on map, and then also in Japan for some reason. And in the 80s, it was discovered in Japan and scientists have no idea why it's so geographically distributed. No one can kind of figure that out. Because most of the time, you know, spores will float through the atmosphere. You know, they're all over. Like, there's definitely, like, genetic, slight like genetic differences, you know, and adjustments. But um, anyways, yeah. So, hey, we've got a star. And I'm not, like, super, I'm, I'm a symbolic person. Like, I don't like the star symbol. Like, I don't like the... It's very a terrible symbol, the Lone Star. I don't hmm. know. I want to. I don't want to get dystopian again. Well, uh, I will for a second because Donna Campbell, the the politician who proposed that, she just blew off a meeting with my union earlier during that. You know, because we also were lobbying to keep people from getting. It's a, it, the we're trying to keep the them from changing the employee pension system over to a 401k system for state employees which you know it didn't we weren't able to stop them from doing that um but yeah so it was i was really kind of upset with her that she wouldn't meet with us to talk about something that's like very very substantial and use this as a like a means you know an easy win pr win for herself um and so it's been really like, is it something that like I wanted to kind of see happen just because like it'd be fun to see like a Texas state mushroom be named. But uh, she. Uh, yeah, it really it really rubbed me the wrong way when she blew us off. Uh, and also, she's my senator also. So that was, you know, kind of doubly pissed me off, uh, even though, I, you know, I didn't vote for her in the first place. She still represents me in the fact that she wouldn't meet with her constituent and, and you know, scheduled a meeting with us and blew us off. Uh, it's just really insulting. Um, yeah. And as far as the Donna, you know, no, Donna Campbell like, is her name in the uh, YouTube. But yeah, you hear me say in a minute. Yeah. Um, and I guess thankfully, like the the mushroom is like not a lone star. And that's the thing that like. Right. You know, and I, I feel like over the last, like, several years, I mean, I didn't grow up in Texas either, so I haven't been indoctrinated into, like, the, like, the Republic, you know, like, everyone still loves to, like, but it essentially, like, our state was a dry run for the Confederacy, and we just have no, I think there was, like, a New York Times bestseller book several years back that just laid it all out there for everybody <laughs> to know, but it's just sort of, Eh, you know, um, mm. it's not really something that, um, but anyways, that's, that's where our sort of, you know, Texas is always threatening to secede, of course, and they'd love to still be, you know, a lone star. Oh, but yeah. thankfully, there's a lot of Texas stars in central texas even though it's rare geographically there's a lot of them here every you know you just have to find a certain type of tree a cedar elm certain type of year and you'll find it i was gonna say it's anything but lone right it's anything <laughs> yeah. but lone yeah of that yeah <laughs> maybe that's the, the, the that's the opportunity to have the conversation you know like oh we got a state mushroom now let's talk about it. you know <laughs> Talk about how we can, you know, be honest. Well, I hope that answered your question there in the in the chat uh, about the Texas star mushrooms and the the political situation around that. But um, yeah, I th we've been going for a while now. Um, if there aren't any more questions to be answered, I think it's a time to sign off um so if anybody so fun. yeah uh thanks for coming on doug um i hope people get a chance to read your book um everyone should go ask their public library to get a copy of the book in the library because that'll be great for sales for doug but it also makes the book really accessible to people in your community so it kind of wins everybody wins 
in that situation. Um, if you liked uh, the kind of talk and presentation tonight, go to our website and uh, you can either donate or be think about becoming a member of the Central Texas Mycological Society and you help support um, more programming like this. We do we do YouTube streams twice a month, um, first and third Thursdays at starting at around seven o'clock. Um, where we kind of, where we sit around and talk about fungi. We sometimes we have a little more of a casual conversation. Other times it's a f more formal presentation. Sometimes it's a mixture of both. Um, so yeah, please tune in, um, like and subscribe this video if you uh, if you don't want to do those other things because that's a really easy way to support us here um, and help our help our presence grow on the internet and uh, help us get more members and everything like that. Um, and with that, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, I say good night. We love you, and uh, have some have so much fun. Thank you all, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.